Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. I'm Amanda Boyce of the National Institute on Aging's Extramural Program. I am thrilled to introduce today's wall speaker, Dr. Helen Blau, a pioneer in the field of cellular reprogramming and its application to stem cell biology. I'd like to acknowledge my co-hosts, Dr. John Williams from NIA, and Drs. Caitlin Sattler and Matt Wolf of the Biomedical Engineering Scientific Interest Group. This group sponsors many NIH lectures that I think today's audience would be very interested in, so please do look them up. Dr. Blau is the Donald E. and Dilia B. Baxter Foundation Professor and Director of the Baxter Laboratory for Stem Cell Biology at Stanford. She is world-renowned, as I noted, for her work on nuclear reprogramming and cell fate plasticity. Her body of research has provided the scientific underpinnings for mammalian cloning and induced pluripotent stem cells. Among her many, many landmark discoveries has been the identity of, small, of novel small molecules and niche proteins that regenerate, expand, and enhance the function of muscle stem cells, which are critical for muscle regeneration. Her lab recently identified a novel hallmark of aging, the prostaglandin degrading enzyme 15-PGDH, and showed that its inhibition augments aged muscle mass and strength. Her lab was also first uh, among the first to design biomaterials to mimic the in vivo microenvironment and direct stem cell fate. More recently, they've determined a new role for telomeres in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which provides novel insights into the development of the disease and potential treatments. Dr. Blau's work has also led to the development of novel technologies, including the discovery of beta-galactosidase complementation, which is now widely used in drug discovery. Not surprisingly, she has at last count 11 patents with at least two others filed. Mind you, this is just a snapshot of her remarkable career. Her honors fittingly have been as numerous as her accomplishments. These include election to the National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Inventors, and the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. A native of the UK, Dr. Blau earned her BA from the University of York in England and a PhD in biology from Harvard University. She kept on moving west after that, receiving postdoctoral training at UCSF before joining Stanford University in 1978, where she has made her home. Lastly, I'm proud to note that Dr. Blau is a grant recipient at the National Institute on Aging. Dr. Blau, thank you so much for being with us today. On behalf of the staff, I welcome you to the NIH. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's really an honor to give this lecture, and I thank you for this invitation. So uh, what I want to tell you about today is our discovery of a gerozyme and its role in regenerating and rejuvenating aged muscles and uh, how we can target it to rejuvenate aging. Um, I've called this a gerozyme because it's an enzyme that appears to have a pivotal role in aging and rejuvenation, as you will see. So first a disclosure, I'm a co-founder of two rejuvenation companies. Uh, so aging is depicted here by one of my favorite artists, Gustav Klimt. Uh, you see the young babe and then glowing motherhood and then decrepit aging. And the question is, does it really have to be that way? Um, and as shown here in uh, nature, just a few years ago, we're living longer. Both the life expectancy of men and of women is longer, but these are not years that are quality years. They're years spent with chronic disease. The years of healthy living are staying stable. So the goal of regenerative medicine or stem cell biology is to increase health span or quality of life so that the proportion of your lifespan uh, that is spent doing the things you love to do, like running a marathon or skiing or hiking are, are prolonged. Less time with chronic disease. And I think this is highlighted, this notion of health span in the, in the myth, um, the uh, Roman mythology of Aurora and Tithonus. Aurora was the goddess of dawn, and she fell in love with a mortal, Tithonus, depicted here on the wall of Casapia at the Vatican, uh, where the Pontifical Academy meets. And 
uh, she fell in love with this mortal and she went to Jupiter, the king of the gods, and said, please grant me just one wish. I want Titanus to live forever, to have eternal life. And so uh, Jupiter granted her wish, gave him uh, eternal life, but she forgot one key point, which is she did not ask for eternal youth. And what happened was that Tithonus aged and became decrepit and lived forever as a decrepit old man. Therefore, we not only want an increase in lifespan, but also health span. And what is crucial to your health span? Muscle is one of the things that is absolutely central to everything you do in life, whether you're a dancer in the ballet or you're a Rodin's thinker, you're using your muscles to breathe and for posture. And if you're uh, Steph Curry of the Golden State Warriors, you are using your muscles, uh, every muscle in your body to shoot those three pointers. So muscle is very important. And with aging, we lose muscle mass and strength. Humans lose 10% of muscle mass per decade after the age of 50. And 5% of people over the age of 60 are affected by sarcopenia, which is this debilitating loss of muscle mass and strength. By the age of 80, one third of people are affected by sarcopenia. So what is sarcopenia? Sarcopenia is an increase in frailty. Loss of muscle mass reduces the ability to perform routine tasks like getting up out of a chair. Uh, there's an increased incidence in falls and this costs billions of dollars because people become dependent after that. They often end up in institutions, in assisted living and their mortality is uh, accelerated. So, uh, what I want to tell you about today is our discovery of a potential way to mediate um, and uh, avoid this downward spiral. And that is our discovery of a gerozyme, this pivotal molecular determinant of aging. And our finding that inhibiting this gerozyme increases not only stem cell function in regeneration, but also rejuvenates aged muscle tissue function. And it acts by enhancing the body's own healing mechanisms, the natural healing mechanisms. So we've taken two approaches. One is to target muscle stem cells and the other muscle fibers. So the muscle stem cells lie along the mature muscle fibers. They are dedicated stem cells that are in a quiescent state, ready to spring into action to replenish the muscle fiber as shown here. And we're targeting both these stem cells and the muscle fibers, the mature muscle fibers, as I'll show you. So muscle stem cells shown here reside in a niche along the muscle fiber. And uh, as shown here by Alexander Morrow in 1961, he identified in an electron micrograph, very prescient, that this was a satellite cell. It was uh, lying along the muscle fiber and he predicted it was the stem cell. It wasn't until many decades later that this was proven true. And these stem cells express hallmark transcription factors like PAC7, and that is essential to their self-renewal. And uh, if there's an injury, they spring into action, become activated, uh, committed progenitors, and then fuse into the myofibers to refuel the myofiber. Well, in order to study the stem cells and understand their regulation, we had to identify ways to prospectively isolate them. And for this purpose, we used a potent transgenic model that expresses GFP and luciferase in all the cells of its body. And uh, we isolated single cells and we did many experiments injecting single cells into the injured hind limbs of uh, non-skid mice, looking for engraftment and expansion of the stem cells by bioluminescence imaging, which is a very potent way to assess stem cell function in muscle. And we identified using this, these three markers that allow isolation of the stem cells. And this shows you the key experiment that we did. We isolated single cells, injected them into the injured hind limb of a mouse, 
And you can see three out of 72 single cell transplants gave a robust bioluminescence imaging signal that you can detect here uh, in a CCD camera. And those cells also contributed to mature myofibers, as you can see here by GFP. So they met the quintessential definition of a stem cell established for HSCs of self-renewal and expansion and differentiation. Once we had the stem cells, we thought, now we can study the factors that regulate them. But we encountered yet another problem, another challenge, which was that if you injected fresh stem cells into the injured hind limb of a mus muscle, they expand robustly. But as you see here, if you culture them on plastic, the usual culture dishes that we use, uh, you see a loss of stem, stem cell function reduction in BLI signal, and uh, that's highlighted here. So uh, the stem cells lose their function in tissue culture. So we wondered how to overcome this, how to, and we reasoned that we should deconstruct the niche using biomaterials, the niche in a dish. And this work was done by a multidisciplinary team in my lab, Penny Gilbert is a biologist, Karen Havenstreit, a chemist, uh, who specialized in these hydrogels, Klaus Magnussen, an artificial intelligence expert who helped us develop algorithms for monitoring single cell time-lapse microscopy, and Ben Cosgrove, uh, a chemical engineer. And what they found was that muscle, when they looked at the rigidity of muscle by rheometry, uh, they found that it has a stiffness of 12 kilopascals. Well, how does that compare to plastic? When we did rheometry of plastic, plastic is ten, five orders of magnitude stiffer than healthy muscle tissue. So plastic is a rigidity that stem cells would never encounter in the body. So we reasoned that this might make a difference. And so we engineered hydrogels um, and we made single cell microwells and biomimetic stem cell niches by combining uh, two different PEG monomers in different concentrations so that we could achieve different uh, rigidities or elasticities of the PEG hydrogel. And these hydrogels have many advantages. They're inert, uh, nothing sticks to them. They're well-defined, unlike matrigel, and they have tunable mechanics so that you can mimic native tissue elasticity. And you can also control ligand uh, printing, which is important for mimicking various ECM, extracellular matrix components in the microwaves. And they can be used then for single cell clonal assays and time-lapse microscopy as well. Here you can see one of these hydrogels and here uh, the microwaves um, in which we did time-lapse microscopy. So does it matter? We uh, Penny Gilbert designed an experiment where she isolated the stem cells using our fax parameters and uh, plated them in uh, single well hydrogels of different rigidity. Two is about the rigidity of brain, 12 is muscle, 42 is a little stiffer, and 10 to the sixth is the rigidity of plastic. And after one week, she transplanted 100 cells from these different uh, hydrogel stiffnesses into the injured hind limb muscles of a mouse, and then looked for engraftment in terms of bioluminescence imaging signal, this potent assay we have for stem cell expansion and engraftment. And what she found was that it makes a huge difference, and that when you look uh, here on the left are a large number of different uh, mouse limbs, but in the middle, you can see uh, typical examples. And uh, when the hydrogel is too soft, uh, as in two kilopascals, or stiff, as in 42, uh, they don't engraft as well as if the cells are on a modulus of 12 kilopascals, which is typical of that of healthy muscle tissue. And you can see that on the appropriate modulus that mimics the stem cell niche of the healthy tissue, 50% of the cells in graft. So uh, to summarize this part of the talk, Goldie cell and the three hydrogel beds. Um, one is too soft, one is too stiff, 
and one is just right. And the stem cells care just as we do about the stiffness of their beds. And this is a parameter that is key for maintaining stemness in culture and has been utilized now uh, by stem cell biologists for numerous different stem cell types. So now that we could maintain the stem cells in these hydrogel wells, we could look for regulators of their, uh, that could control their expansion and maybe even rejuvenation. So we were interested in what happens with aging and we isolated stem cells from aged uh, mice and found that if we just engrafted, just injected 10 cells at a time into the injured hind limbs, um, we found that uh, the function of these stem cells falls off with aging. And you see this drop from 56% engraftment in young to 21% in the aged. That's evident by bioluminescence imaging and also by contribution to the muscle fibers as evidenced by GFP. And in fact, when we did limiting dilution analysis, we found that as few as two thirds of the cells uh, are non-functional in the aged, only one third are functional. And we wondered if the, we could find a way to restore that function. So uh, Ben Cosgrove in the lab did a candidate drug screen and found SB202, which is a small molecule that inhibits P38 MAP kinase. And here you can see that in aged stem cells, there is an increase in the target uh, phospho P38. So to uh, test whether this would have an effect, what, what Ben did was isolate aged muscle stem cells and young muscle stem cells and plate them either on plastic or on hydrogel in the presence or absence of the uh, drug, the SB202 inhibitor of P38 MAP kinase, and then transplant 100 cells from each condition into the injured hind limbs of a mouse. And this injury is done by notexin, which is a snake venom toxin that does extensive damage to the myofibers. And this is what he found. Uh, the young muscle stem cells are doing so well on hydrogel that uh, the drug makes no difference. They graft really robustly, as you can see here by BLI. And the aged on plastic are doing so poorly that uh, even in the presence of the drug, they're not restored. However, if you plate the aged stem cells on a hydrogel that mimics the elasticity of the young niche in conjunction with treatment with the SB uh, P38 MAP kinase inhibitor, you now see robust expansion of the stem cells. And, and that's depicted over here for a large number. And you can see that we've restored the engraftment potential of the aged back to that of young. So this shows that there's a synergy of the bi biochemical and biophysical properties, the hydrogel uh, rigidity and uh, inhibiting a signaling pathway that corroborate to rejuvenate the function of these stem cells. Well, that was all good and well for engraftment, but what about function? Uh, we now sought to find out whether um, this increased muscle strength. So in this case, Ben isolated the stem cells from a 24-month-old mouse, cultured them on hydrogels in the presence or absence of the P38 MAP kinase inhibitor SB, and then transplanted them into injured, aged TA muscles of the leg. And uh, what you see here is that young, have, uh, young mice have a um, high twitch force strength. This is a measure of their strength. And with aging, that decreases nearly 50%. And after injury with no texan, it decreases even further. But if we transplant the progeny of uh, 200 aged muscle stem cells that were cultured on a hydrogel together with the, with the uh, P38 MAP kinase inhibitor SB, you now restore strength to that of young. This is shown for one example here, but we did a number of different mice and that's uh, summarized here and you can see uh, that we've restored the strength of the aged muscles, that of uh, young muscles by this treatment. So this stands as a very useful cell therapeutic approach uh, for isolating the cells, rejuvenating them, and then 
putting it back into the muscle. But that's quite a, a labor intensive and uh, not very cost effective approach. Um, and so we sought other approaches. We also more recently have described um, another marker of aging stem cells, and that is CD47. And this was discovered by um, Irma Linda Propilia using CyTOC, which is a high dimensional uh, analysis where you can stain um, cells, both intracellular markers and cell surface markers, using metal tagged antibodies, and then subject them to uh, you nebulize them and then do um, time of flight cytometry by time of flight or cytop. And you can look at the uh, cluster of markers of the individual cells by X shift analysis. And you can see here when we look at the aged stem cells, they're expressing PAC7, the hallmark transcription factor of the stem cell, and they have elevated CD47 on their cell surface. And when we looked at uh, by fax separation, you can see that the, the proportion of cells expressing high CD47 is increased with aging. Uh, that's shown here down below there. 80% of the aged stem cells have elevated CD47 on their cell surface. And this affects their engraftment potential. You can see now that uh, their engraftment, when you look at the CD47 high from uh, young and aged, the engraftment potential drops remarkably. And this turns out to be due to uh, alternative polyadenylation choice that leads to more of the long isoform of CD47 that is localized to the cell membrane, um, whereas uh, the intracellular form is not, the alternate form is not expressed on the cell surface. It is the cell surface form that has this deleterious effect. And in fact, CD47 is a very interesting molecule. You probably know it as the don't eat me signal that is expressed on cancer cells to avoid the immune system. And in fact, it mediates bidirectional signaling. It's a ligand for SERP alpha, which is the don't eat me signal that is recognized by the immune cells. And, uh, and probably on uh, the stem cells, it prevents the immune system from clearing the stem cells as well. And it's also a component of this integrin complex. And importantly, for, for our purposes, it's a receptor for thrombospondin 1. And we reasoned that um, thrombospondin might be playing a role. And in fact, we found that the aged stem cells, a subset of aged stem cells, are secreting uh, thrombospondin 1, and that that inhibits the proliferation of the aged stem cells. And in fact, if we treat the cells either in vitro or in vivo with an antibody, a blockade of the uh, thrombospondin, we can overcome this block and enhance the uh, engraftment of the stem cells. So CD47 distinguishes two functionally distinct aged stem cell populations. It's regulated by alternative polyadenylation and um, and it can be overcome by a thrombospondin blockade. But I want to now turn, uh, not discuss this further, although we have many interesting lines of data there, um, but I want to turn to this gerozyme and how we discovered it. So the gerozyme regulates PGE2 levels. And PGE2 is a natural inflammatory mediator that stimulates muscle stem cell function, as I'll show you. And we discovered it because we were looking uh, for something that might be in this wave of inflammation immediately after damage. When there's damage to the muscle and to many tissues, PGE2 is elevated and there's this wave of inflammation. And we reasoned that the stem cells might be exquisitely sensitive to something in that inflammatory uh, wave. And this work was done by two very talented postdocs, Andrew Ho and Adelaide Apoa. So what they did was an in silico screen. They were looking for uh, regulators of inflammation on activated stem cells. We searched the database from our own lab and two others, looking for uh, regulators of inflammation um, immediately after injury in the stem cells. And EP4 was one of the highest hits. EP4 is a receptor for prostaglandin E2. It's a 
GPCR on the cell surface. And uh, we reason that uh, very little has been done to uh, elucidate the role of PGE2 in muscle stem cell function, maybe because it doesn't appear on a transcriptome because PGE2 is a metabolite. It is uh, derived from membrane phospholipids by phospholipases giving rise to arachidonic acid and then in a sequence of enzymatic steps to PGE2. And that can act on any one of four receptors. Uh, on muscle stem cells and on muscle fibers, EP4 is the predominant GPCR that is expressed uh, in the muscle. And that signals via cyclic AMP. Importantly, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents like indomethacin or ibuprofen, block the synthesis of PGE2. They block your natural healing response. So to find out whether this uh, pathway was important, uh, we performed a conditional ablation of EP4, the receptor, on stem cells specifically by creating this mouse model where PAC7, the hallmark transcription factor, drives uh, CRE and leads to ablation of the EP4 receptor on stem cells specifically, then perform an injury, you know, toxin injection, and then assay strength several weeks later. And what we found was that in the absence of being able to detect this signaling pathway, the mice actually got weaker. You see twitch force drop and tetanic force drop if this signaling pathway is not detected. And the cells in culture in the absence of PGE2 uh, barely proliferate. So this turns out to be a crucial pathway, signaling pathway in the function of stem cells in regeneration. And we looked at a large number of mice and you can see twitch force and tetanic force decline. So young mice get weaker if uh, they regenerate their muscles in the absence of this signaling pathway in stem cells. We did another experiment to look at the significance of the pathway. Um, and here we uh, made a different mouse model where PAC7, the hallmark transcription factor, is driving luciferase. So luciferase is a readout of stem cells. And you can see that after an injury, if we give the mice an NSAID like ibuprofen, uh, we block endogenous PGE2 synthesis, and that leads to a decline in stem cells. They cannot expand. They need the signaling pathway to proliferate and expand and engraft. And this is also reflected in a loss of strength, a loss of force. The young mice get weaker. And this, uh, this was picked up, this story, by the New York Times. Bring on the exercise and hold the painkillers. No pain, no gain. Because when you exercise, when you run a, a marathon or you work out in the gym, you are doing damage to your muscles. It's a good damage. It's the way you build muscle. But you absolutely need this PGE2 signaling pathway. And if you take uh, an ibuprofen right after you feel achy because you exercised, uh, you're probably negating the good you did. So what about the role of PGE2 in aging? So it was not clear that this would have a beneficial effect because unlike the young niche where you see the orderly uh, sequential appearance of different cell types after an injury, the age niche is dysregulated. And you see this uh, chronic increase in inflammatory cells uh, in particular and FAPs and fibroadipocytes. So uh, we wondered whether PGE2 could have a beneficial effect we looked at the uh, muscles of young and aged, and you can see here the EP4 receptor uh, is present robustly on young muscle stem cells, but not on aged in the muscle tissue. This is a, a cross section, or this is a longitudinal section of a muscle uh, fiber. And you can see here that the uh, percentage of uh, receptor positive stem cells decreases and, and the intensity or the number of receptors also decreases. And also signaling via phosphocreb is decreased in the aged relative to the young. And in addition, we, we did uh, RNA-seq analysis, single cell RNA-seq analysis to understand the role of 
uh, the PGE2 signaling pathway in myogenesis in young and aged. And when we did that, uh, we were able to see two trajectories. There was a myogenic trajectory that was a cycling trajectory where the cells expand, they proliferate, and um, their numbers increase, and a direct commitment trajectory where they prematurely commit, stop proliferating, and become uh, differentiated and committed uh, cells. And what we found was that the young muscle stem cells primarily adopt this self cycling pathway, which is the reason they can regenerate so effectively because they can expand and cycle, whereas the aged prematurely commit. They more of them adopt this direct commitment trajectory. And when we looked at the kinds of uh, molecules that are expressed in the um, in the uh, cycling pathway, PGE2 signaling was one of the most prominent. You can see the entire cascade is highly represented, and that is part of this cycling trajectory that is lost in the aged and represented very strongly in the young. This is also reflected in uh, the epigenetic signature. So we did a tax seek of aged and young muscle stem cells after exposure to PGE2 for just two hours, uh, when one would see an expansion of their proliferation. And what you see is that the aged muscle stem cells have uh, open motifs. Chromatin is open at the AP1 motif, at the CBP motif, and the E-boxes that are so crucial to muscle stem cell function are closed. But after just two hours of exposure to PGE2, we found that the aged become rejuvenated, that the CREB motif is opened, the E-box motif is opened, and the AP1 motif is shut. So there is a dramatic change in chromatin um, to reflect a more rejuvenated epigenetic signature. And this is also seen here uh, by time-lapse. So here you can see an analysis by time-lapse microscopy of the function of the aged muscle stem cells in the presence and absence of PGE2. So this gives you an example of one of these hydrogel microwells where we're monitoring the progeny of the stem cells uh, in the presence or absence of PGE2. And what you can see on the left in of the age, single age stem cell exposed just to vehicle, and on the right exposed to PGE2, I think it becomes readily apparent that you have this massive increase in cell numbers because you have more proliferation. And in particular, you have fewer cell death events as shown at the bottom here. So uh, PGE2 is uh, promoting proliferation, cell cycle, and also preventing cell death. Look at the number of cells that are accumulating there. And this is uh, reflected also in the transcriptome. So if we expose uh, aged muscle stem cells to PGE2 for 24 hours, if you look at the young, your transcriptome analysis for three young and three young treated with PGE2, you can see they don't differ much because the young are doing so well in their regenerative function. And the aged, however, there's a block of genes that are highly expressed and another block of genes that are, are uh, decreased. But after exposure to PGE2, you now see a rejuvenation of this aged muscle stem cell transcriptome. And when we looked by uh, go term analysis, we, this was also reflected there. There was a negative regulation of cell death genes, a uh, negative regulation of programmed necrotic cell death. So this uh, mitotic catastrophe is overcome by PGE2 and uh, there's an increase in survival and survival related genes. Well, how does this affect the cells? Um, we did a, because absolutely function is by far the most important. I've shown you loss of function experiments, but now I want to show you that if we co-inject aged muscle stem cells with DMPGE2, which is a more stable form of prostaglandin E2, it's still only in the circulation for three hours. We co-inject and we look after injury, 
at uh, the BLI signal, which is the measure of stem cell expansion and engraftment. Here you can see that the cells engraft, and this is a log scale, uh, far more efficiently after a transient exposure to PGE2. And if we give a second injury, texan, we see that they further increase in their engraftment, showing that these are still stem cells. They have not uh, become committed and they have their stem cell potential is, is present. So this shows also that there is a memory that's induced by this short term, term exposure of the stem cells to a PGE2, which is what we saw reflected in the attack seek chromatin signature as well. Another line of evidence, we can also see that PGE2 enhances the endogenous age stem cell function during regeneration and leading to increased strength. So in this case, we injected um, DMPGE2 into the muscle of aged mice, in this case, geriatric mice. And uh, thank you, NIA, for making these mice available to us for these studies, which has been invaluable to these discoveries. And uh, we see that um, if we give a DMPGE2 two days after injury, so we're enhancing the endogenous uh, healing response of PGE2. On day 14, just two weeks later, we see an increase in cross-sectional area, the size, the diameter of the muscle fibers. You see a shift in these diameters and cross-sectional area to larger muscle fibers. And that's reflected here also a greater number in PAC7 positive muscle stem cells. And so regeneration is enhanced. In addition, we see an increase in, in uh, muscle mass of the tibialis anterior and in strength measured by titanic force and in absolute force or torque. So uh, endogenous stem cells respond robustly to PGE2 intramuscular injection leading to increased sizes of the muscle and increased function in terms of strength. Well, notexin is one way to do damage, but it's not a very uh, physiologic damage. So we decided to look at a more physiologic damage by subjecting the mice to downhill running, uh, running on a downhill treadmill. And um, they ran for 10 minutes a day for one week. And on each of those days, we gave them a shot of PGE2. They ran for another week. And then at the end of four weeks, we looked at their strength. And as you can see here, there's a robust increase in their twitch force and in their titanic force. And that's shown here for a number of mice. So strength is uh, robustly increased um, by a, an acute, uh, a short-term treatment with PGE2 has a long-term effect in increasing the strength of aged mice. So we wondered um, whether we could globally increase muscle function with PGE2 uh, instead of just injecting it locally into a muscle. And this is what led us to the discovery of the Gerozyme. And this work was done by three uh, very talented postdocs, Adelaide Pala, Minakshi Ravachandran, and Will Wang. And uh, what they reasoned was that maybe we could increase PGE2 levels uh, by targeting the degrading enzyme of PGE2, 15 PGDH. So we reasoned that like many good things, PGE2 levels might decline with aging. We analyzed uh, using a very sensitive mass spec method that can distinguish these closely related uh, prostaglandins that differ maybe by a hydroxyl group, PGE2, PGD2. And you can see here that they decline by maybe 30% with aging. And that's shown here resolved by uh, mass spec. And uh, when we look at uh, what might be responsible, we found that the 15 PGDH specific activity, the specific activity of this degrading enzyme is increased in muscle, if you look here at uh, aged versus young, um, you see that it's increased in muscle and colon and spleen and skin and heart. So uh, it's not just specific to muscle, it's elevated in a number of tissues. And we show here for muscle that it's increased at the RNA level, it's increased by 
um, Western blot and also specific activity. Importantly, this is not just a function of aged mice, but is also relevant to aged humans. We mined a, a microarray database and found that in aged humans, on average, uh, 50 pgdh is elevated. Some people are young um, in terms of pgdh levels, as is true for, for all markers. They're biologically younger, but on average, it's elevated. So we reasoned that if we could target this enzyme, uh, the gerozyme, um, that degrades PGE2 with a small molecule inhibitor, we might be able to elevate PGE2 globally and in a physiologic range, just restoring it back to youthful levels. And uh, so we did that using SW. We targeted the uh, gerozyme. And here you can see that we restored PGE2 levels back to youthful levels if we injected uh, the, the inhibitor. And did this make a difference? So uh, we injected aged mice um, daily for intraperitoneally for one month. And you can see here that the cross-sectional area of the myofibers is dramatically increased. There's a shift in myofiber sizes uh, to larger sizes. Here you can see the quantification of the mean cross-sectional area dramatically increasing after this treatment, uh, after this global systemic elevation of PGE2 levels due to targeting the gerozyme 15 PGDH. And importantly, this isn't just specific to one fiber type. We see that different fiber types that have different myosin heavy chains, different contractile properties also exhibit this increase in myofiber diameter. And importantly, uh, we also see this reflected in function. So if we uh, inject mice either with vehicle control or with this SW small molecule inhibitor, 15 PGDH daily for one month, we now see an increase in muscle mass of the GA, but we've also looked at the TA and the soleus. They all increase in mass significantly. And we see an increase in strength, uh, comparing their starting strength um, to their strength after one month of treatment. And now you see that young also increase their strength, even though they have less of the enzyme. Uh, there's a more robust effect in aging. And we also see that there's an effect in endurance. The time to exhaustion running on a treadmill is increased. And that suggests then more than just muscle is affected by elevating PGE2 systemically, uh, maybe more tissues than just muscle, an area that we're very interested in and pursuing actively. To show that this was a specific effect, since small molecules can have off-target effects, we did an shRNA. Um, we used a gene therapy approach to knock down the enzyme using a specific shRNA um, to 15 PG, PGDH. And you can see here, we, we knocked down the levels of the mRNA, the specific activity declined just 30%. That was enough to restore PGE2 levels back to youthful levels, just as we saw with the small molecule inhibitor. And we saw, as with the small molecule inhibitor, an increase in TA muscle mass and GA muscle mass and uh, absolute strength and also relative strength to baseline, showing the specificity of the small molecule and the specificity of this effect uh, for 15 PGDH. We wanted to know whether this was through stem cells, since we'd shown PGE2 has a robust effect on regeneration. Was this entirely due to an effect on stem cells or were the myofibers involved? And we found that on uh, myotubes and myofibers, EP4 is the predominant receptor for PGE2 as it is on muscle stem cells. So in this case, we made a transgenic model where we uh, fluxed the EP4 receptor in the myofiber specifically by driving uh, the Cree from MCK Cree, which is uh, which is muscle creatine kinase, which is specific to the myofibers. It's not expressed in the stem cells. 
And lo and behold, we found that after we ablated this receptor in the stems, in the myofibers, the mature myofibers, they no longer were responsive to the small molecule inhibitor SW, showing that in fact, it is through myofibers. And in fact, this drug is a double whammy. The PGE2 is acting both on the stem cells and the myofibers. And then to see whether this is really a pivotal regulator and why do I call it a gerozyme and a pivotal regulator, I think this experiment is, is the, uh, the nail in the coffin, the piece de resistance. What we did here was overexpress PGDH in young mouse muscles using a gene therapy approach, AAB, to deliver the PGDH. Uh, we injected into the muscles of a three-month-old mouse, and one month later, we analyzed their strength. And you could see here evidence that the mRNA level of the enzyme is increased and uh, that the PGE2 is decreased as a result by mass spec analysis. And then we looked at force, and you can see this dramatic decline in strength and in TA muscle mass as well. So the muscles in response to expression of this single enzyme are shrinking and weakening. It's really quite dramatic. And that really is the evidence that this is a pivotal regulator. I never thought given that uh, aging is so pleiotropic that one single molecule could have such a robust effect. So what is the source of PGDH in muscle that is uh, causing the deleterious effects with aging? Uh, to understand that, we used CODEX, which is a multiplex imaging approach, because it turns out that it's very difficult to uh, visualize um, PGDH definitively by immunofluorescence by traditional methods. And this immunofluorescence method allows you to look at up to 40 antibodies simultaneously on a single tissue section. Uh, it was developed by my neighbor in the Baxter lab at Stanford, um, Gary Nolan. And it uses uh, unique non-overlapping DNA barcodes that are, um, that are uh, uh, conjugated to uh, antibodies and, and, to fluor and then secondarily revealed by fluorophores um, with antisense. So you do three antibodies at a time, stain the tissue, and, um, and then you can resolve it by microfluidic analysis. And what this looks like is as follows. Uh, here you can see, so normally you can only visualize maybe three antibodies at a time by immunofluorescence, but using codex, you can look at up to 40. Here you see a longitudinal section of a muscle. Uh, you see laminin outlining the myofibers. Here's myosin heavy chain. And now you see the tendon uh, that connects the muscle to the bone. And you can see the motor neurons and the neuromuscular junctions. Uh, and you can also see the immune cells and subsets of immune cells. And you can also see the, the vasculature, which is extensive in the muscle. And you can look at injured areas uh, and very clearly see what they are. And using this analysis, which I can't do justice to right now, but I want to whet your appetite to its potency, you can use neural network and machine learning approaches to analyze this multiplexed imaging and segment the cells, identify unique features like ECM scaffolds and uh, sites of regeneration. And you can uh, um, compose and quantify the tissue composition uh, of the stem cells over time and space um, and look at cell-cell interactions, tissue architecture, and various molecules in a way that just is unprecedented. And this has allowed uh, us through Will Wang's efforts to annotate multiple cell types shown here. And you can see just through the colors and the changes after injury that the neighborhoods, the cell-cell interactions are changing over this time course of regeneration. And you can look at specific changes here. The M1 macrophages are peaking at day three and the uh, CD8 T cells are peaking at day six and you can find their, their uh, neighborhoods are changing. And you can go into much more detail looking at the innate response, innate immune response, the adaptive immune response and subsets of cells and how they change in their neighborhoods uh, with regeneration and with aging. 
Um, but the, for the purpose of this talk, it enabled us to localize where the gerozyme is. And as you can see here, it's barely expressed in young muscle. It is there, but at low levels. But in aging, you see it uh, localized in these muscle fibers. It's also present in aged macrophages in the muscle tissue. And that may be the source of the PTDH in uh, other tissues where it's elevated with aging. And how does it work? How does it have this profound uh, effect on muscle and targeting it? How does that increase muscle function? Well, we did a transcriptome analysis and uh, what we found um, when you compare the transcriptome of vehicle treated and SW treated uh, aged mouse muscles, you can see that there's a down regulation of ubiquitin related um, genes. These are the enzymes, the ubiquitin ligases um, that degrade proteins with aging and that become more abundant. We're turning them down. TGF beta signaling is also a pathway that arises with aging and has deleterious effects. Myostatin is a component of that pathway. And you can see that after treatment with our small molecule inhibitor, uh, we are downregulating this deleterious TGF beta signaling. And we validated some of these markers um, by qPCR as well, and um, also showed that phosphate pathway is involved. And we validated it also by SHRNA knockdown. Importantly, not only are deleterious pathways uh, downregulated, but beneficial pathways like mitochondrial pathways are upregulated. And you see here this uh, robust increase in complex one, three, four, five uh, components of uh, mitochondrial function. And also, if you look at the muscle tissue, I think this says it more loudly than any transcriptome analysis. If you look at the aged muscle tissue, you now see these disorganized myofibrils and interspersed between them are these mitochondria that are vacuous and distended and compare that with the uh, tissue on the right, which was uh, from aged mice that were treated for one month with the SW small molecule inhibitor of PGDH. And what you see is this orderly uh, tissue now and these compact mitochondria. And this results from an increase in mitochondrial biogenesis. We see that reflected in PGC1 alpha expression also in numbers of mitochondria, and they're, they're more compact, they're more functional uh, than they were before, and there's an increase in autophagy, which is likely responsible for this extensive remodeling of the tissue. Not only are there more mitochondria, but they are more functional. If we look at various uh, Krebs cycle functions, citrate synthase goes down with aging and is restored by treatment with uh, SW for uh, one month, succinate dehydrogenase declines with aging and is restored uh, after treatment for one month. And we see that membrane potential also declines with aging and is restored by this treatment. So uh, to summarize, um, what I've shown you is that inhibition of the prostaglandin degrading enzyme 15 PGDH increases muscle strength in sarcopenic aged mice. So in the young muscle tissue on the left, you see uh, orderly myofibrils and condensed mitochondria with aging, PGH increases in expression, PGE2 is metabolized to an inactive form um, and you get these vacuous mitochondria and disorganized tissue. But you can rejuvenate that tissue either by a small molecule inhibitor of 15 PGDH or a targeted knockdown of the enzyme. And that leads to an increase in PGE2 levels, muscle mass and strength, autophagy, atrogenes decline, TGF beta signaling declines, and mitochondrial biogenesis and function increase. So, uh, in summary, PG2 signaling is really critical for the muscle maintenance and regeneration and rejuvenation of muscle. And we think that its potency derives from its, its dual uh, targets. PG2 rejuvenates and uh, re 
replenishes the function of aged muscle stem cells. So it targets the stem cells to promote their regeneration. It's, it's part of this essential inflammatory uh, process, the body's natural healing mechanism. And PG2 is required and sufficient for the stem cells to proliferate and survive and engraft. In addition, PGE2 rejuvenates the aged myofiber function. And uh, with aging, this enzyme, this gerozyme, increases in, in expression. And as I've shown you, it's a pivotal molecular determinant of, of muscle aging. It's a new hallmark of aged muscles. It's a master regulator of muscle aging in that if you overexpress it in young, the young mice become weaker and their muscles become smaller. And if you inhibit this gerozyme, just physiologically modulating it uh, back to a youthful level and restoring PGE2 levels, you regain strength in one month, 15% increase in strength in aged mice. If this translates to humans, it would be super exciting uh, because humans lose greater than 50%. Uh, they lose after you aged 50, 10% of your muscle mass per decade. So uh, we postulate that this targeting of 15 PGDH could be a therapeutic strategy to counter muscle loss due to immobilization after prolonged bed rest, uh, say due to COVID or due to um, injury or, um, or sarcopenia, muscle wasting with aging. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention. I wanna acknowledge uh, the super people I have in my lab from different countries and different backgrounds, multidisciplinary group who have made this possible and my funding sources and the NIA for um, funding and for the provision of these aged mice that make this work possible. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Well. Beautiful presentation, fascinating work. We do have a few questions, but only a few minutes. So I will just start at the top. We'll maybe be able to answer one or two of these. So the first question we got was going back to the beginning, looking at the stiffness studies with the extracellular matrix. Um, and the question was, do you know what was lost or gained in the muscle stem cells that were cultured in a too stiff or a, a too soft environment? Was it a, an issue of they did they fail, did they all fail to engraft, did they fail to proliferate, those sorts of things? Uh, yes, they fail to proliferate. They uh, turn on signaling pathways that are are deleterious to engraftment. They, they simply don't expand and don't regenerate the tissue. Um, and someone else asked, um, talking about the effects of ibuprofen specifically, um, do you know if metformin has a similar inhibitory effect that, that uh, ibuprofen has? And they also followed up to ask how long ibuprofen uh, is uh, uh, how long the effects last once you take it, I guess, presumably as a, as a pill, as a human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people always ask me that, you know, how long do you have to wait until uh, after exercising till you can take this pain reliever? And um, we, we really don't know. And also uh, extrapolating to human, we would need to do human studies to totally understand this. But I think it's, it's just a cautionary uh, note that this pathway is super important to the function of your muscles, your muscle fibers, your muscle stem cells, um, and that uh, inhibiting the pathway is probably not a good thing, like daily aspirin, for instance, uh, that has been prescribed but is less prescribed now um, for maintaining a healthy heart, for instance. I think people are revisiting uh, that. So it's... Uh, yeah, something to use in, in moderation. <laughs> sure. And do you no know pain, if there no is, any, yeah. is any overlap with metformin? Do you have any idea how the how the two uh, pathways, if they, they are the same pathways? Uh, I don't believe they are. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this final question here is, could the 15 PGDH blockade have any effect on neurodegenerative diseases associated with increased mitophagy um, from a non-aging etiology? Mm, very interesting. Yes, that's something that we are actively investigating, uh, whether this could, uh, because with aging, uh, you lose neuromuscular connection, you lose your neuromuscular junctions, uh, inner denervation is a big part of 
loss of muscle function with aging. And of course, it's associated with various uh, muscular dystrophies, in particular, spinomuscular atrophy. You lose uh, neuromuscular connectivity. We're very interested in, and actively pursuing whether um, this could counter the loss of neuromuscular junctions and enhance neuromuscular function. That's an excellent question. And I have a quick question that's personal. So one of the things in the dystrophy field that people have always talked about is trying to scale up muscle stem cells and being able to use them. And of course, using the, 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 the proper stiffness in culture could help. Is this, I guess the question is this, is this scalable at all? Will we ever be able to yeah. make significant quantities of muscle stem cells for transplantation? Um, yes, it is scalable. And I think it would be possible. Uh, not, of course, throughout the body, but for localized treatment, um, for strengthening muscles in a localized way, I think it's, it's quite reasonable to think that this could be performed. Yeah. And we, we're going to, I know people probably have to log off here. I do have to uh, reiterate the CME number before anybody leaves is 44442. And I have a final question here, which I think is great. This is a person who said that it was a beautiful talk. And the question was, how do you stay so passionate and effective <laughs> through your career? <laughs> <laughs> you just have to love what you're doing. And, uh, and I do. And I, uh, part of the thrill is bringing people together from different countries, different disciplines, and uh, things happen when you have an engineer sitting next to an artificial intelligence expert and, uh, and helping people reach their full potential. I love training and teaching. Um, and the thought that something that was developed, I've spent my entire career studying fundamental questions uh, of uh, nuclear reprogramming and how that happens and stem cell function. I'm particularly excited now that uh, this may be translatable, that we something in my lab may actually benefit people and become a drug. And that is very motivating. And, and I want to understand how it works. It's, it's like a gift to find something that's completely new. No one ever studied this enzyme and its upregulation with aging. And uh, there's so much to discover. It's uncharted territory. And uh, that makes me very excited. <laughs> I think everybody is very excited after, after listening to the presentation. I would encourage anyone to follow up with you via email if they've got questions about, uh, about anything else about the presentation, or if, of course, they're interested in possibly working for the lab. I know the NIH has a, is a rich source for postdocs and uh, um, would encourage that too. So thank you very much for this talk. It's been an honor. Um, and uh, with that, I say that this is the end of the, the walls for this week. And thanks everyone for joining.